All right, Amos chapter 7, what we're going to be focusing in on is kind of in the middle of the chapter here. We start off the chapter saying, you know, these different um, plagues that he's planning on sending against the children of Israel. And Amos is interceding and, and asking God not to do that. And God's changing mind. He says, you know, God repents. He says, okay, I won't do that. And he's saying, look, God, you know, Jacob's small. How is he even going to grow? God says, okay, I won't do that. And then he continues here in, chapter, in verse number 7. He says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. Now, when I had read this passage before, I didn't know what a plumb line was. And I don't know, who, who here knows what a plumb line is? You know what a plumb line is? I had to look it up. But it's, um, apparently it's an instrument. You just hang down on, with like a string or a thread. You hang it down to measure how straight, how vertical what you're doing is. So it's saying here that the Lord stood on a wall. They built this wall. And basically what God's doing, it says he has this plumb line in his hand and he said that the wall was built by a plumb line. So they're basically using this instrument to make sure that it's straight, but now he's going to check on their work. Supposedly they had used this plumb line when they, when they went and built this wall. So now God basically is saying God is going there and he's checking whether or not it actually is straight. Did they do a good job in building this? They claim that this was their standard. They claim that they used a plumb line to make sure that it was level, that it was straight. So it says here in verse 7, it says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. So he's taking this example of something physical, of a wall that you would use a tool to make sure that it's straight and saying, okay, here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to measure up the people of Israel. The same way that you'd use this, this plumb line to measure and make sure that the work you did is straight, that it's upright, that it's, that it's the way it was designed to be. God says, I have a standard. I have a standard for my people Israel. I have a standard for the way that they ought to be behaving themselves. I have a law. I have standards for them. I'm going to set a plumb line in the midst of Israel. And we'll see. This is my measuring stick. I'm going to see how they measure up. And the title of my, my sermon this morning is, How Do You Measure Up? God has a lot of standards for us in ways that we ought to be behaving ourselves and laws that we ought to be following and adhering to. And... You know, this is, this is something that we all have to take stock of individually. We have the plumb line, as it were, in God's holy word. We have the measuring stick. It's right here. It's written down in this book. Amen. How do we stack up to this book? Now, I understand we all have our own problems, there, but there is a standard for us. See, um, In Matthew 5, verse 48, you don't have to turn there, but the Bible says, Jesus Christ himself said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. God has set very high standards for us to obey and to follow. God's law is perfect, and he says, This is what I want you to do. Now, none of us are able to measure up to that standard. None of us are. The Bible says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So God has his standard, and basically we come short of that. We don't measure up. When we look at God's law, when we look at our lives, and we take that plumb line and we try to measure ourselves up against it, we fall short. Everybody does. Everybody falls short of that, which is why we need salvation through Jesus Christ, which is why we need the free gift of eternal life, because none of us can measure up to that. And as soon as we break God's law, as soon as we transgress, we fall in short. We don't stack up. God says, well, you know, you deserve a punishment and his punishment is hell. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And praise the Lord for that. That even though we don't measure up, He still loves us. And He loved us enough to send us the, His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to pay for our sins. But I'm trying to get this part out of the way in the beginning of the sermon. Because 
Just because we're all sinners and we don't measure up to the perfect standard of the Lord doesn't mean that we just forsake it and just say, well, I can't do it anyways and I'm just going to give it up and just say, whatever, who cares? And just say, well, I'm saved because, you know, Christ saved me. And hey, if your faith is in Christ, that's true. But the Bible says in Romans 6, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You know, just because you're forgiven of your sins doesn't mean that you should just go off and just, and just forget about God's standards and just continue in the sin. That is not the, the life that God has, has laid out for us to live. We need to be doing our best to try as hard as we can to measure up so that if God were to take the plumb line, yeah, are we going to be perfect? No, we're not going to be perfect. But we want to make sure we're upright. I mean, we want to make sure we're not straying that far from, from the standard that he has set up. We want, to, we want him to come up and, and be able to measure us and be pleased with the work that's gone into us and, and be able to um, be upright. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to see, we're going to look at some scripture about God's expectations of us. So that we can, we can gauge ourselves. We can measure ourselves. In the New Testament, you have the book of Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians. If you've hit Colossians, you've gone too far. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 8. <clears throat> see if we get a good idea of what God's expectation is of us now we all inherently have somewhat of a knowledge of what God expects of us God's given us to that in our nature he's given us the sense of right and wrong he's given us consciences but we need to go beyond that that's not enough. Oftentimes we can deceive ourselves into thinking something's just fine, but when we compare it up against the standard of God's word, it actually falls short. Satan's doing a good job out there of trying to convince people that sin actually isn't that bad. That sin isn't that bad. It's, it's God's actually okay with these things or whatever. And that's his goal and his agenda is to try to get us farther away from the word of God. But we need to be continually going back to God's word and saying, this is the standard. This is the plumb line. This is what I'm going to compare myself to. Look at verse number eight of Philippians chapter number three is where we're going to start reading. The Bible reads, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And here he's describing his salvation. And he's saying, look, I'm not trusting in my own righteousness because we all fall short of that standard. I'm trusting in the, the finished work of Jesus Christ. And here's the great thing about, about salvation and what Jesus Christ did because Jesus Christ is the perfect example. He did everything right. So when God, if, if God were to lay the plumb line against Jesus, he would be absolutely perfect without one flaw because he was. He was the spotless lamb. He was without sin. He did everything. Jesus Christ himself even, even said, I do always those things that please the Father. He is the plumb line, exactly. Jesus Christ is the standard for us. He measures up, He is the standard. And the great thing about our salvation, though, is that we falter from that, but when you get saved, when your faith is in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ's good works and everything that He is gets imputed unto you. Not only are your sins forgiven, but the righteousness of Jesus is also imputed unto you. You have forgiveness and pardoning of your sins. You have atonement for what you've done that's wrong. You also receive the imputation of Jesus Christ's good works and the good things that He did. Get, get, you get viewed through Christ and through His standard. And it's no longer based on you and your works once you've received Christ. And that's, that's good news. And he's saying that. He's like, look, I'm not trusting in my own righteousness. But he's going to continue on here, though. 
He doesn't just stop there and saying, well, yes, you know, we're not just, just trusting in our own righteousness to be saved, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to try to be righteous. Let's keep reading. Because he says in verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now, some people get confused by this and he's saying, well, wait a minute. No, I didn't already attain it. Does that mean he doesn't think he's already saved? That's not what he's saying. It's, it's a real simple concept he's trying to explain here. He knows he's already saved by the blood of Jesus. He knows he's saved through grace. But what he's saying is that he's, I follow after that I may apprehend, that I may get that which I have already am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He's, like, he's I've already been given this free gift, but I'm working as if to attain that through the works. Like that's his, 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 the way that he's working. Not that he trusts in that or thinks that that's even possible, but that's like the goal. That's the, he's, he's trying to reach that standard as much as possible. Even though it's already been given as a free gift, he's, I'm trying to just do it as best as possible. He's not trusting in it, but that's the, the, the motivation and the mindset that he has. That we could have that same mindset that if it were possible, that if we can just apprehend and attain this level of being perfect. We know we can't, but that's what the goal is. That's the mark. That's the, 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 the high calling that we're trying to achieve. It's what he says here in verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now, when we see that word perfect in the Bible, I just want to point this out. The word perfect doesn't necessarily mean sinless. It, like The way that we think of perfect, perfect today, we think of just without spot, without any problems, absolutely you know, a sinless would be like the way that we think of perfect. In the Bible, when it says perfect, it means complete. It means you're not lacking in one area. You're, you're basically complete. It doesn't mean you're completely sinless. It just means you're whole. You're, you're, you're completed. And um, well, let's keep reading here. Verse 16 says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So here we get a hint of He's, he's giving a contrast. He's saying, look, you have examples here. You have me. You have other apostles. You have other disciples that you can use as examples of how to serve God, of how to do what's right. And he's saying, but then there's other people that are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction. It says, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So the opposite of, of the standard of God of doing what's right would be, just being concerned about your belly, about your appetite, your physical desires, your physical fleshly lusts, whether it be, you know, food is an obvious one that comes to mind. It's not saying that eating food is sinful, but if that's just all you're about is just satisfying your desires. That's why people get involved in things with fornication and adultery and doing things contrary to God's law because, hey, it just feels good to the flesh. That's why people get involved in taking these drugs and drinking alcohol and just, and just getting high and, and doing things that to their flesh it just feels good. And that's what they're all about and that's what they spend their time on. And their end is destruction. God inherently brings these, these repercussions in with those sins. And he's saying, look, you're not supposed to be living just for your belly. You, don't, you, don't, you shouldn't be minding the earthly things. Our vision should be to have the faith to know that God has more in store for us in heaven and we need to be working to attain the, the rewards that he has laid out for us in heaven. But, you know, the stuff on this earth, it's going to be burnt up. 
It's all going to perish. It's all going to pass away. God's going to destroy this whole earth one day. So who cares about the boats and the cars and the fancy houses and everything else that you can work for and accumulate on this earth? It's all going to come to nothing. It's going to be just gone, dust, forgotten. You're not even going to remember these things anymore. Who cares about the little gadgets and all these other things that people get so excited about and they work for and that's what they think about? Oh, I can't wait till I get this device or that device or this computer or this car, whatever it is, people just set their minds on these things of the earth. That is not the standard we need to be following. We need to be setting our mind on, on heavenly things, on godly things, on the things that God has ordained for us to be using our time doing on this planet, on this earth. We all have a mission to achieve. God has a job for you to do. If you're still here and breathing, God has work for you to do. That's why we're here. We have to realize that God has something for us to do. It's not just, this isn't heaven. This isn't a time to just enjoy ourselves. He's given us work to do on this earth. We're not just, he doesn't just give us this earth and just say, okay, just lounge around and relax and take it easy and, and, and that's it. No, God has a lot of work that needs to be done. Jesus Christ came as the example. And I love looking at him. When do you see Jesus just resting in the Bible? You don't see it. You see Jesus working, working, working. He's ministering unto other people. He's preaching. He's healing. He's praying. When everyone else is going out, going to bed or whatever, he's going up in a mountain. He's praying for hours. And then he's getting up really early and going out and doing more work. All throughout the Bible, for the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, he is working nonstop. He's the example. We need to make sure that we are also focus on working and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a judgment seat of Christ. We have to keep this in mind. The Bible refers, and I'm, I've preached an entire sermon regarding the judgment seat of Christ. For all believers, see, there's two judgments. There's the great white throne judgment, which is at the end of everything. That's where the unbelievers are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. That is not a judgment seat you want to be in front of because that's where people are judged by their works because they don't have Christ as their Savior and they are going to be thrown into a lake of fire. But there's the judgment seat of Christ, which happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ when He comes back and He catches up all, of his, all the believers we're going to stand before Jesus and He's going to give us rewards based on our works. He's going to judge us in the things that we've done in our bodies on this earth. He's going to mete out rewards. And basically, He's going to take all the works, all the accumulation of our life, He's going to put it all in one place, He's going to try it by fire. And He says there's, there's um, wood, hay, and stubble that's just going to get burnt up. The things that you do in this lifetime that have no eternal value, that, that really mean nothing, that are going to get burnt up anyways. The businesses that you build or whatever, the whatever things that you do, which they're not even necessarily sinful, but they but they're, have no value. They're going to get burnt up. But the things that you do for God that have eternal value, when you preach the gospel, when you can convert other souls unto Christ, hey, that lasts forever. Someone receiving eternal life, that is, a, that is something that lasts forever. That's something that God has told you to do. That's work that you've done for Christ. And that's where you're going to be judged on. And that's where we're going to receive rewards on. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. It's just, it's just backwards from Philippians where you were. Just a couple pages. Ephesians chapter 4. If you're still in Philippians 3, just turn back about two pages. You should be in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, we're going to start reading in verse number 11 to get this whole thing in context. The Bible reads, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he's saying he's given apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers all for this job of perfecting the saints. The saints are those that are sanctified through Christ Jesus. If you're a believer, you're a saint. You know, we don't believe in, in like the Catholic Church teaches that, you know, that you have these various saints that have achieved sainthood through their good works. The Bible says that every believer is a saint. 
We're all sanctified through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that God has given us certain people to fill a role, to fill a position, to be a teacher, to be an evangelist, to be a pastor for the perfecting of the saints so that we could come together to church and we can be perfected. We, could, we can learn more about the Bible. We can learn more about the work of the ministry. He says for the work of the ministry, we could be, people could be sent out and doing different tasks to serve God and it's for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And again, we're seeing Christ here as the standard. He is the measure that we measure ourselves against. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Another important reason to come to church is a lot of people out there that are trying to deceive. They're tricky. They're cunning. They use the Bible. They'll take Bible verses and say, oh yeah, see, look, God said this, but they're, but they're crafting it and they're twisting it and perverting the Bible to suit their own means. And they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing is what they are. They look good on the outside. They'll have this great appearance like, hey, look, I'm godly, I'm a man of God, but they're, try but they're just distorting God's word. And we need to be watching out for that, which is a good reason to get into church and not just think that, oh, you know, I'm too good for every church. I know way more. I don't need this. Look, if, you, if that were possible for people just to be way too good for church and just above and beyond ever having to come to church, then why did God ordain and give evangelists and give pastors and give teachers for the perfecting of the saints? He did this for a specific reason. This is what God ordained. He ordained the local church, the congregation of the believers. This is what he has for us to do, not to forsake the assembling as the manner of some is, as Hebrews 5 says, but exhorting each other and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be in church so much the more because there's so many devils out there. There's so many false prophets. They lie in wait to deceive. They set traps. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So we're getting another admonition here saying, look, don't walk like other people walk. You're saved. You're set apart from this world. You need to be different. Don't measure yourself against the standard of this world. Here is the measure. He's going to go into saying how other people walk. Don't walk like they walk. Don't be like them in the vanity of their mind. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When you get saved, there, the Bible says there's a new creature that is born inside of you. You have a spirit that is born again. That's what's being a born-again believer. You have a new birth. You have a spiritual birth inside of you. That is a new person. You still have your old man. You still have that same exact man that you were before. And that old man of the flesh likes to continue to doing the sins that you used to do. So once you get saved, it doesn't mean that you're automatically just going to stop all of your sins because you're a new person. No, what it, what's done is you've added another person. You still have the old one, but now you have a new man. And the new man, the Bible says here, is created in righteousness and true holiness. And that's why, you know, some people get confused, and I'm not going to go there, but in 1 John chapter 3, it talks about um, whosoever at, um, you know, basically if you're born again, that you don't sin. 
that you, you, you don't sin at all. And, and what he's referring to is the new man. The new man that is born of the word of God, the perfect seed, the holy word of God, is perfect and without sin. And that's another reason why once we die, we shed this flesh, our, our spirit gets to go to heaven because the spirit, that new man, is without sin. The new man is sinless. The flesh is a sinful body. But once we, we pass that off, we get to go to heaven. And, but we have this, this battle. We have this struggle between the new man and the old man, between our spirit and our flesh every day. And Apostle Paul talks a lot about this, having to die to self daily and being able to put away the lusts of the flesh. He says in, um, continuing reading here, verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. So here's one of the standards. Don't lie. Make sure everything that you say is truthful. That you could be a, a person of integrity. That people can hear what you say and not question you and wonder, wow, is this guy telling the truth or not? I don't know. I've caught him in lies before. It's important to have a good testimony to be able to, so that when you talk to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ and explain salvation to them, they don't have a reason to just doubt you and think that you must be lying to them because you're not lying already. You're not known for lying. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man the truth for, uh, with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. The Bible says, be ye angry. A lot of people say if you're ever angry, it's a sin. But that's not true. The Bible says here, be angry and sin not. So there's a way that you can be angry about things without sinning. Now he adds in there, and sin not, because it's easy to get into sin when you get angry. When you have that emotion come over you of anger, it's easy to make a wrong decision and do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing because you're angry. But he's saying, you know what? No, you need to get angry. We need to get angry about sin. We need to get angry about the wickedness that's going on in the society. We need to get angry and let that stir us up, but also make sure we don't sin. Use that anger to, to, in, in the right way. He's saying, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you get angry about stuff, you get fired up, but you don't hold on to that anger either and just let it fester inside of you. So he says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. He's saying, okay, you get angry, but you know what? At the end of the day, you ought to be able to just to let that go and continue on and move forward and get a new start on the next day. He says, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. So here we see, you know, we see a lot of re references basically to the Ten Commandments in here. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, corrupt communication, what is that? We talk about corrupt communication. Well, thing, well, something that's been corrupted is something that used to be pure, but now it's not anymore. There's a lot of corrupt communication in society. There's a lot of people who, who use, whether it be filthy language or not even just you know, specific words, which to me, honestly, you know, I, don't, I don't get upset when someone uses a four-letter word. I get way more upset when they say like Jesus Christ as a curse word or something like that because... They're using the Lord's name in vain, and they're doing things specifically against what God said. You know, if someone uses some other four-letter word, to me, I think it's just ignorance and stupidity because what comes across to me is that this person's not very educated. They're not very serious about what they're saying because they're throwing around these terms that just makes you sound ignorant and dumb. And that, I mean... That's the way that I view it. Now, if you want to use those words, whatever. You know, I'm not going you know, to be upset with you or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't offend me. But I'm going to look at you and not take you as seriously. When you don't, when you don't have a, a normal vocabulary and can use words. Because there's no reason to use these four-letter words that, that are just vulgar. And that are depicting things that are dirty. That are corrupt. I mean, I, I start thinking of some of the four-letter words that I know. They're all, they're all regarding things that are, that are not stuff that you would normally be talking about. <laughs> they're kind of, they're dirty things. There's no reason to say these dirty words. But not just that, the corrupt communication could be just talking about things in general that we shouldn't be talking about. You know, for example, things that go on in the bedroom. Look, there's no reason to be having these conversations with people. This stuff is private. 
We don't need to have this corrupt communication. Now, you may be on a job. You may work in a blue-collar environment. I know I did for years. And this could be the language and the conversations that go on. But you, O oh Christian believer who's been sanctified, you don't need to partake in that. You don't need to bring yourself down to that level. You've been saved from that. The Bible's saying, look, this is the standard. Don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is the standard. This is one of the standards we see. A, lot of, a long list here of things. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. He's saying put these things away with you, from you with all malice. Malice is bad intent towards other people, right? And be ye kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is the attitude that we need to have. Don't be ready to take vengeance on other people when they do you wrong. We need to have a forgiving heart and, and being able to receive what's, what comes our way um, the way that Christ has for us. <clears throat> I think I'm going to skip past this. I've got, I've got a lot of notes. I know I'm not going to be able to get to everything this morning because there's so much scripture that we could go into. <laughs> But God, we need to understand that God has a standard for us. God knows, um, God, God has an expectation. I'll just, I'll just briefly go over the story for you. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12, because this is something I want to I wanna get to is Luke chapter 12. But if you remember in Daniel, remember King Nebuchadnezzar, and he got all lifted up with pride, and he thought that, that the kingdom that he was in charge of, that he built up that kingdom and it was all based on his might when really God is the one who had given it into his hand. And he had gotten so lifted up with pride that God had to bring him low and he gave him the heart of a beast. And he actually was out in the, in the like outside in the um, environment eating grass and it says his, his hair became like feathers and his nails grew out and became like claws, like a bird's claws. And he basically became like an animal because he didn't give God the glory and the credit where it was due. So all of those things happened to him. And then he finally got in his right mind after like seven years of being that way. You know, he came to and, and he humbled himself. and He's like, you know what? I was wrong. You know, God is the one that, that lifts up and brings down. God is the one in charge of things, you know. He's the one that gets the credit, and he humbled himself. Well, then his son takes the throne, and he throws this big party, and he brings in all the vessels of the temple. They got the, the cups and everything that's used that was supposed to be used in the temple of God because now, now they're in Babylon, and they had, they had taken all that stuff spoil, and they brought it back to Babylon, and he's throwing this big party, and they're boozing it up and drinking out of these vessels that were supposed to be holy for God and just showing utter disregard for the holy things of God. Doesn't care at all about it. So while they're having this party, this hand appears, just the form of a hand, and it writes on the wall. And when he sees this, the Bible says that his knees smote together. He's, he's literally quivering and shaking. He's so scared. He sees this image of just a hand. And this is where that phrase comes from, knowing the writing on the wall. Because they didn't know what it said. They couldn't read the writing on the wall. Because it was written in another language. So they get all their astrologers and, and all their false prophets and all these guys together. And they're saying, you know, trying to say, well, what does this say? And no one's able to read it. But Daniel was able to read it. And the message was this. It says, he reads the message. He says, it was, Mini, mini, tikel, you farsin. And he says, this is the interpretation of the thing. Meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So God had a standard for this king. And he's saying, look, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, your father, went through all of this. And you didn't learn anything from him. 
You are desecrating the holy things of God. You have the same attitude that he had before he was humbled. You don't care about these things. God has a standard for you as a king, the way you ought to lead. He says, you are weighed in the balances and you're found wanting. He says, you're way up here because you need to, you need to have more, um, more weight to show of, of the things that God had wanted you to do. When, when, you're, when you're weighed and measured the way that God measures you, you are found wanting, you are lacking, and for that reason, God's taking away the kingdom from you. God has a standard for everybody, for all of us, the way that we ought to live. One of it is for salvation, and His standard for salvation is absolute perfection. None of us can reach that standard, which is why we need to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But He has a standard for us in just the way that we ought to be living our lives as His children. The same way that I have a standard for my children. I have rules for them to obey and I expect them to follow them. There's a standard set in my household for the way that they need to behave themselves. God has a standard for His children in the way that we ought to behave ourselves. You're in Luke chapter 12. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. And this is something we need to take to heart. Now he's talking about the Pharisees because they would say one thing and do another. And he's referring to their hypocrisy. But what does he say? He says, there is nothing that, that's hid right now that isn't going to be made known. We need to remember that in our life when you think that you get away with something. When you know something's wrong, you know something is a sin. But you say, you know what? I've got the perfect opportunity. Nobody's here. Nobody's around. I'm going to get away with this. Well, the Bible's saying, no, you won't. You may think you do. Maybe for a short period of time you do. You know, the Pharisees were able to, to deceive people for a while. But in the end, guess what? God's going to bring it to light. God's going to bring everything to the surface. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. You know, maybe you have an opportunity at, on the job and everyone else is gone and you have this great opportunity and there's just cash sitting out and you can just, hey, you can stick it in your pocket and no one's going to know the difference. Or maybe you work for a company they make all kinds of money no one's even going to even know that you did it. Look, God sees these things. God knows what happens. Or for me, for example, you know, I came home last night. My wife is down in Phoenix. I could be like, well, hey, I have the whole house to myself. I could do all kinds of I could do all kinds of things because she's not here. But you know what? God sees what's going on. God's going to know whether or not what I'm doing is right or wrong. And if I'm doing wrong, guess what? He's going to bring it to light. And we need to remember these things to help keep ourselves in line, to help keep ourselves close to that standard that we don't just give in to the lusts of our flesh. Verse number three, Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. That which ye have spoken in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And we need a good, godly fear these days. And this is what I'm saying. You know, people get into these situations where they think they're going to be able to get away with sin. And the reason why people even do that is because they don't have the proper fear of God. Look, God sees everything that you do. He even knows your thoughts. We need to maintain that proper fear of the Lord. And no, and don't, don't just think like, you know, we have a tendency because we don't see him on a daily basis at all. I mean, we don't see him. It's not something that we physically, tangibly deal with. You kind of lose sight that God's even there. You kind of forget about him. That's why we need to be in our word every day. We need to be reading this Bible and, and thinking on him and know, hey, look, God is there all the time. We need that proper fear of God. He's saying, look, don't fear these other people. Do what God told you to do without worrying about what they're going to do. You need to be fearing God. Daddy's going to come down with a whooping if you're not doing what he's told you to do. Is what is, you know, is my, my, my uh, translation of what he's saying here. You don't want to get whooped. Do what dad told you to do. Don't worry about what they say. You know, I tell my kids, you're going to do the right thing. Don't worry about the other kids laughing at you or making fun of you. Hey, look, I said that you need to pray for your food and give God thanks for every meal that you have. 
And if people are going to make fun of you out in public, don't worry about them. You worry about me. Because if you're not doing what I told you to do, there's going to be consequences. God has the standard for us. He says, and that, that's just one example. You know, obviously there's all kinds of things. God has given us what He wants us to do with our lives. He tells us in His Word. And if we're not doing that, hey, we need to have that proper fear of God. Motivation. Jump down to verse number 42. We're seeing the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. This is a parable that's given, but he's saying, look, God's given you work to do. If he comes back and he's saying, you're not doing the work I told you to do. He's saying, there's going to be, a, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be punishment to face. And he's saying, look, if you knew to do something and you didn't do it, that's way worse than if you didn't really know what to do and you don't do it. If you sin through ignorance, it's not as much of a punishment, but he's still getting punishment. He's saying that he who didn't know, he said he's going to be beaten with few stripes, but he's still going to get a beating. He's still going to get punishment. Ignorance isn't just an excuse to say, oh, well, I didn't know. Hey, unto whom much is given shall much be required. God has given us his whole counsel. We have all of his word. Unlike many people throughout history, Today, for the, for the past 2,000 years roughly, we have the entire Bible. We have all of God's Word. Not everybody has had that. We have much given to us. And the ease with which, and I covered this last week in a sermon, but the ease with which we can get God's Word in the United States of America, you can spend $1 and have all of God's words at your fingertips. Much is given. That is easy. That is easy. Don't tell me that that's hard. You can go into this church and get one for free. You don't even have to have a dollar. We'll give it to you. And we're not the only church like that. There's many churches out there that are willing to give you a free Bible. You have to pay nothing. It is available. Much is, is available for you, but it's up to you to pick it up and read it. It's up to you to follow it. It's up to you to obey it. And look, once you have it and you see it, God says, well, you don't have an excuse. It's there. I've made it available. And he says, if you know the Lord's will, you, pre pre you don't prepare yourself and you don't do it, he says, you'll be beaten with many stripes. I'm almost done. I'm going to wrap things up here. Let's see. What's the last point I want to make? Just flip back to, to Luke chapter 11. I'm going to read from you out of 2 Corinthians 10 because, you know, we're trying to, to measure ourselves, right? And we said early on, Jesus Christ is that measurement. In our zeal to do what's right, in our zeal to be righteous and to do things that are good, we need to make sure that we maintain that Christ is the standard and not other people. It's easy to get comfortable in your own spirituality and start comparing yourselves against other people and say, oh, I'm doing so great and I'm such a wonderful person because I'm better than this person over here. I'm doing things way better than these people are. And then start getting comfortable in, in where you're at in your own walk with God and your own spirituality and thinking that you've arrived. Just like the Pharisees. Exactly. It's just like the Pharisees. They compare themselves. And in 2 Corinthians 10, what, it, what the Bible says is, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. So we start comparing yourself again, just against other people or even just people within this church and just saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm much better than that person. You're saying that's not wise. 
And that's not the standard. You know, I'm not the standard in this church. So these are comparisons. Oh, well, I'm, I'm much more holy than Pastor Burson is. Well, look, I'm not the standard. Now, I hopefully should be leading the congregation and, and you know, Try, you know, <laughs> being in a position that that would be better for the leader to, to be the most spiritual among the people, but that's not even how we gauge ourselves. That's not even what we're supposed to be looking at. We're supposed to be looking at how do I personally measure up against Jesus Christ? Every single one of us. And don't start to start feeling good. Oh, well, yeah, I'm way better than this person. They, they've been coming to church for 10 years and I just got started and I'm already way more holy than them. Look, that's foolishness. Don't worry about their walk with God. You worry about your own walk with God. And don't get puffed up thinking that you're so great because the standard is Jesus Christ and we all fall short of that. We need to stay humble. He says in verse 13, But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. For he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. He's saying you don't get commendations on yourself of saying, oh, well, I'm this great person, and you commend yourself and lift yourself up. The honor comes when someone else does it. When God lifts you up, when God gives you the, the praise, that is what's worthy. It's not you saying, look at me, look at how much I've done. The last verse I just want to point out is in Luke 11. So we're in Luke 12. Just flip back to Luke 11. Because one thing, no matter who you are, if you're saved, one thing that God has for us to do, and this is the main focus and the main drive of this church, is preaching the gospel to other people. All, there's so many things that are involved in the Christian life and, and, and how we ought to be living and the standard that we set. But the one thing that is so vitally important is being able to take the free gift of salvation, what Jesus Christ came to do for us, to die for our sins, and to be able to show other people and get other people saved and show them that free gift. That is a work. That is a job. The ministry of reconciliation is committed unto us. God has that job for every single believer. Man, Woman, boy, girl. There's other positions that have different qualifications. For the example, the pastor. The Bible gives these different qualifications. Well, if you don't meet these qualifications, you can't be the pastor. There's other qualifications you know, for deacons. Okay, If you don't meet these qualifications, you can't do that. But preaching the gospel, the only qualification is are you saved? Are you born again? If you meet that qualification, then you are fit for the job. And that job is given unto you because that job is for all of us. Luke 11, look at verse 23. This is what Jesus Christ said. He said, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. He that, think about that. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. There is no in-between. There isn't, well, I'm not gathering, but I'm also not scattering. I'm just, I'm just doing nothing. Right? It would be like if I were to tell you, hey, we're going to go out and we're going to gather all of the apples on my apple tree out front. We're going to all go out as a group and we need to, I want to gather those apples. We're going to gather that fruit. Right? In this example, you might be able to say, oh, well, I'm just going to stay inside and do nothing. Jesus said that's not, that's not an option. If you aren't gathering, basically he's saying if you're not going out and picking that fruit and bringing it in, it's just like you're taking the fruit and whipping it across the street and saying, well, you, now you've got to go over there. You're scattering it. You're making it much more difficult to gather the fruit. So he's saying if you aren't doing this, then that, this is, you know, if you're not gathering, you're scattering. If we aren't gathering souls for Christ, if we're not going out and trying to reap the harvest and trying to, to witness the people and get them saved, do you know what we're doing? We're actually scattering. We're actually doing harm unto the cause of Christ. We're making it more difficult for people to get saved because we're not gathering. And you might say, well, I don't understand that. Well, look, that's what Jesus Christ said. He says, look, 
If you're not with me, you are against me. There is no neutrality. You're either with me or you're against me. If you're not gathering with me, you're scattering abroad. This is the standard of Jesus. This may not be the standard that other people take. This may not be the standard that, that you have taken in your own life. But this is the standard that is Jesus Christ. His standard says, you're either with me or against me. You're either working for me or you're working against me. There is no not working. Not working means you're working against him. Let us do the work that God has called us out to do and let's hold ourselves to that plumb line of Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can even know what that plumb line is is by getting in your book every single day. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together and to, and to learn about you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be more righteous, not for the sake of, of ourselves as, as far as being able to lift ourselves up and say, oh, look at me, look at how good and righteous I am, dear Lord, but for the sake of others that we might be able to preach your word and have a good testimony that we, yes, we truly do believe these things. That yes, not only do I believe the Bible is true, but I'm trying to live it because I believe that it's true, dear Lord. When people can see that, that, you take the, that, they, that we take the word seriously, that we are setting ourselves up against the standard and, and we are trying our best to do that, dear Lord, that will have much more of an impact when we try to tell people that and expect them to believe that your word is true. When we hold to your words, as truth and try to incorporate them in our life dear lord we thank you so much for all the instruction you give us help us not to uh, disregard your instructions but that we would meditate on your instructions daily dear lord and that we would be able to die to flesh daily and walk in the new man in the spirit every single day dear lord in jesus name we pray amen, amen.